We are in week three of a series called Faith Fit, and uh, we want our faith to be fit in the Lord, and we want to help uh, ourselves and, and the Lord understand how that works. And somebody today came up to me just before service and handed me a pickle jar. Does anybody remember the pickle jar two weeks ago? And uh, they wrote things all, talking about me, you know, getting strong enough, you know, I've been working out with weights and going to the gym and realizing, you know, when I was younger, you know, Kathy would hand me that pickle jar and I would just, you know, pop that thing, no problem. And the other day, I was telling the folks two weeks ago, man, I got a hold of one and I was giving it all I had and nothing. And I was feeling so not manly as my wife was laughing at me, you know, and, and so we've been working out with weights and trying to get some strength back. And somebody brings me this pickle jar, and it, it says, they wrote stuff all over it. You can do it, exclamation point. And uh, let's see, it says, be faith fit. And it says, uh, we believe in you, Pastor Tim. And uh, let's see, what else does it say here? Um, uh, faith grip builder. You know, this is my faith grip builder. Oh. Oh, it says this is high V, uh, low sodium kosher dill pickles. So they even got me the right kind. Uh, beet Kathy was something else they put on there. And we know you can, we know you can something. We love you, Pat. I rubbed it off already. Anyway, very cute. Thank you very much. Here, Glenn, you can take that. Set it close to my wife. Don't, don't let her open it, all right? So, so for you that maybe haven't been here for the first couple, let me help you understand where we've been. We've been talking about faith fit, and uh, we've been trying to realize that God, you know, faith begins when the Word of God is preached and ministered to, and, and that the source of, the source of our faith is the Lord. His Word is Jesus. And as that is preached, it, it releases something in us and allows us to receive faith. And then we can move into a saving faith. Saving faith is a gift from God. Yeah, and I'm so glad that, that I have saving faith today. So many of you have saving faith. It's a gift from God. And, and, it, and it begins to build. That saving faith develops as we, the Bible says, to repent of our sins. And sometimes if we're not careful, we lose that uh, understanding that, it, that, it, that we need to repent. That, that the gift of faith, the saving faith, is not anything we can do. All we can, I mean, it's a gift from God. Nothing we can do. We repent of our sins. We do what Romans 10, 9 says. We confess him as Savior and Lord. We believe that God raised his son, Jesus, from the dead. As we begin to speak those things, then the saving faith begins to develop in our hearts and transform our lives. And then it takes us to a substance-producing faith. There's all kinds of faith. We need the shield of faith. And we need sanctifying faith as God sets us apart for himself. And that's what I love watching. Many of you, I watch your life. It's literally being set apart for God's purposes. That's called sanctifying faith. This substance-producing faith happens when, when we take what we have in Christ and begin to work out. You know, that, and I told the story of that guy that left that 350 pounds on that bench, and he'd working out, and man, he had arms like tree trunks. And uh, he had to go to the bathroom, and I walked over there. I set down my 10-pound dumbbell, and I walked over there, and I'm going to, while he's at the bathroom, I'm going to see what I can do with this 350 pounds. And I got all hyped up, and, psyched, and I was huffing and puffing and blowing and, <laughs> and nothing. That thing wouldn't move. It wouldn't even budge. So I went, bound, went back and got my 10-pound dumbbell. And what we learn spiritually is, is we have to begin to start where we are. We start where we are. We start with the obedience that we know. You know, some people want, see, and that represents authority. The authority you have in your life is how much you can bless somebody, how much you can change something in your life with the authority of Christ in you. And it has to begin somewhere. Some of you need some great authority to see tremendous things change in your life. 
in your family, in your finances, in, in your situation, in, in some of the dark places going on, and you're praying, God, give me authority. But here's the thing. The authority grows by the, when we develop our faith. How do we, we start where we are? We start, you know, some people want to be able to speak like Jesus and lay hands on somebody and see blind eyes open, but we're not in the Word every morning. We're not giving our day to God. We're not starting our day by saying, good morning, Jesus. Thank you for the day that you have made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. See, that's living by faith. We start where we are. You, you know, I can't, I can't move them 65-pound dumbbells yet. I, I can lift them with both hands and carry it over to somebody, but, but I can't do this yet. Now, I'm working up. I'm past the 10 pounds now, and I graduated at 15. I got to 20, and now I'm doing some 25s and even some 30s. So it's working. It's slow. You know, it's been four and a half years to get to this point. No, it's been six months. But it's working. Why? Because I want more authority in my life. I want more strength. I want to live long and be healthy because I believe God has a, a lot of work for me ahead to do and I was letting myself go and I realized I need to get back. And you know, spiritually, by faith, we got to get back because some of you need the authority of God. To, God gave Adam, he said, Adam, if something's not right, subdue it. That means change it. You t we're waiting for God to do it, and God said, I've given you everything you need. Begin to activate the faith you have by growing in your faith. You start where you are, and I'm going to give Jesus had so much authority that the Bible says many times when he prayed, when he spoke the word of the Lord, it, sometimes it says that self-same hour. How would you like to be able to see some of the great mountains in your life move when you speak, when you begin to declare and decree something? This is what happens. And so, i got to set this down. I'm getting tired. So, we realize that uh, the life of faith, last week we talked about the life of faith is lived from a different place. That was the whole theme last week. The life of faith is lived from a different place. It's lived from the inside out. We begin to really realize as God began to speak to us that if we're not careful, the enemy's plan is for us to live from the outside in. The, the, the enemy's plan is for the outside of world, everything that's going on around us to be, begin to get so loud that we can't hear that still small voice of the Lord, that whisper of the Lord. For, for our outside world, everything going on to become so loud and vicious and magnified that, that the inside of us becomes small. But God's people who live a life of faith begin to understand we have to live from the inside out. And when we begin to spend time with the Lord and grow in our faith, our inside gets so big that the outside has to start changing. That when, when, that when we get big enough on the inside in Jesus, that there's not room for things on the outside that don't fit anymore. Somebody said, well, I've been working so hard at giving up these cigarettes, Pastor. Pray for me that I'll get... And I said, no, I'm not going to pray for you to give up those cigarettes. You're never going to get... Just begin to tank up on Jesus and begin to grow in your faith and your love for him and in the Word of God. And here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Someday, all of a sudden, you're going to realize there's no room for that anymore. I refuse to condemn anybody, make them feel bad because they're smoking. I just tell them, hey, start... Start loving Jesus more, and all of a sudden you're going to find there's no room for that stuff that doesn't belong. <laughs> Besides, you all know, I told you, my, my dad used to smoke three and a half packs a day, and it was the hardest thing he ever gave up, but he began to serve the Lord and get into the Word of God, and all of a sudden, uh, praise God, he, he began to to trust the Lord and live by faith and before long the cigarettes had to go and it was tough it was never easy for him but but God did it you know but dad dad told me one day he said you know I realized I never did smoke I told you see if you smoke cigarettes you don't really smoke the cigarette is what smokes you're just the sucker on the other end I, I don't want to make you feel bad but there's there's there's, there's a truth to, in there somewhere oh I'm sorry that was terrible. That was terrible. So we live from the inside out. Some of you are here today, and you needed to be reminded of that. Some of you have got some things going on in your outside world 
that if the devil has his way, it's going to run you over. But I'm telling you, in Jesus, we can start living from the inside out. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. We begin to magnify and praise the name of Jesus, and all of a sudden, the inside gets bigger. And the outside has to change to accommodate what God's doing on the inside. Somebody amen me or praise the Lord with me if you believe it. So that brings us to today. Today we're going to talk about the life of faith is built on promise. The life of faith is built on promise. Promise has to do with hope, imagination, dreams, and vision. Look at this scripture with me in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 through 12. By an act of faith, he, Abraham, lived in the country promised him, lived as a stranger camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. There's that word promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. By faith, barren Sarah, she could not conceive, she could not bear a child. By faith, barren Sarah was able to become pregnant. Old woman as she was at the time, because she believed the one, is there a capital O on that one right there? You know who that is, right? The one who made a promise would do what he said. That's how it happened from one man's dead and shriveled loins. There are now people numbering into the millions. Man, I thought about that. It's exciting. When you read that scripture, you realize, I mean, can you see old Abraham still hanging on to that promise? I mean, he's old. He's 100 years old. Can you see him with that? I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> I mean, can you see them townspeople? Well, look at that old coot. He's done gone off. And the Bible says Sarah, she's old too. Barren. And the Bible, you read that story. She laughed. Does anybody remember the story? She laughed. But you got to be careful. Don't laugh at the promise of God. You may be the one carrying that promise. Yeah, she was carrying it. It happened. God gave him a baby. You know, and here's the thing. We cannot actually receive a promise unless we have the ability to envision the promise. For you to understand that there are promises from God that he has for you, for you to really latch on to it, you have to begin to envision it. You know, if I made you a promise, uh, let's say I made you personally a promise that on Tuesday at noon, I want you to meet me at my office because I'm going to take you out for lunch on Tuesday. And I'm going to take you to my favorite hamburger joint and I'm going to buy you the best hamburger you have ever had in your life. 100% Angus beef, eight ounces, a half a pound of the most perfectly cooked hamburger, juicy with a, with a big old slab of melted cheddar cheese and four strips of delicious bacon on top with a beautiful roll. How many are envisioning this right now? You're getting a vision of this. Anybody getting the vision with some fries that'll make you want to slap your mama? I mean, they are some good fries. So, some of you have already got your ingredients on them. Some of you have got that, if you're like my sister Tammy, you've got a big old thick slice of raw onion right on there. Some of you have got Thousand Island. Some of you have got mayonnaise and, or ketchup, and you've got pickles or tomato. You, you, you've already got that. How many are envisioning this? Some of you are like, can't wait for this service to be over right now. Right? There's probably some of you that are so good at envisioning things, you, you not only cannot, you, you can see it, there's probably somebody here who can smell it. Is there anybody here who is so vivid with their mouth, you can literally begin to smell it right now. Anybody can smell it? Oh, right back there, he can smell that thing. Man, I, I'm kind of that way too. I'm, right now, I'm picturing smashing that thing and the juice rolling out of that hamburger on that plate. Whew! 
I'm feeling anointed right now. I don't know if it's the Spirit of God, but it's some kind of anointing right there. But notice, we can only truly respond to the promise that I'm making you that if you show up at my office at noon, I'm taking you out for lunch. That it's, that promise is only, can only happen based on your ability to envision the promise. So the life of faith lives from a place on the inside that places a demand on us to dream and envision the promise that God has for us. If I could take that hamburger story into the spiritual realm. When God says to you in 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. We can only get excited about that based on our ability to envision that it really can be that way by faith. When Paul and Silas said to the jailer, believe and you can be saved, you see, Paul and Silas, the Bible says, were the inner dungeon. They were as low as you could go in that dungeon in Rome where, where the rats were coming by the sewage system and the sewage was rolling by underneath their jail cell and they were in stocks and bonds and they had been beaten and whipped and they were beat down. And here they are preaching the gospel and, and in the natural they could be thinking, why are we here? We're doing Doing what God's called us to do but the Bible says in about the midnight hour they begin to praise and worship their God they didn't sing sad songs they didn't they'd be, they didn't begin to say pity me Paul or Silas have pity on me they begin to say let's create the atmosphere for God in the inner dungeon there is an outside world here there is a stinking smell in this foul place we are in stocks and chains we've been whipped we are hurting the outside world world is huge but let's begin to notify what's going on on the inside that says if if the Lord shall be lifted up if we will praise the name of the Lord he will lift us higher and they begin to praise the Lord and sing songs and hymns in the midnight hour and all of a sudden there came an earthquake see when they begin to praise God on the inside something shook on the outside something had to change all of a sudden they realized the earthquake qu came the jail doors flew open, the Bible says. The stocks and chains came off. And the jailer said, I am toast. The Roman government is going to kill me. He took his sword and he's about ready to slit his throat. And Paul and Silas said, hold it. Don't kill yourself. And here's all the jail doors are open. Here's what's interesting when you read that story. All the prisoners were still there. Paul and Silas said, don't. We're still here. And I'm thinking, why are you still there? How many know if you're down in the inner dungeon where there's raw sewage and you've been beaten and now the doors are open and you got a chance to get out? In the natural, I'm boogieing. I don't run very good, but I'd be running. But they didn't. Why? They had been ministering to the Lord. And when they did, they were entertaining the presence of God that came into that place. They were in the presence of God in the midst of a horrifying situation. I want to tell you, you folks, we can be in the midst of the presence of God even in a horrifying situation in our lives. We can begin to live from the inside out. We can live from a different place because we can believe in the promises of God because we can envision it. We don't have the hamburger, but we can begin to envision the promise. And some good news. Paul and Silas didn't go lick their wounds. The jailer said, what must I do to be saved? How many know the presence was thick when he says, what must I do to be saved? They ministered salvation to him and his whole family were saved. And before the night was out, they baptized him. They were about the father's business. See, when God's word comes to us, it places a demand on our faith to envision. We reach forward in our spirit based on his promise. And it's not only in based in it's not only based on our ability to envision, but it's also based on our ability to believe in the one who promised. 
Now, I don't want to leave this part out of this message because sometimes it's hard for us to receive the promise. Why? Because someone, you know, someone before promised you a hamburger and you didn't get it. We don't believe in everybody's promises. Is that right? You don't believe in everybody. You know, some folks tell you they're going to do such and such, and you don't believe it the moment they tell you because they've lied 10 times before. So faith moves towards a promise, but faith is also built on the one, capital O, the one God who promised. God's never broke his promise. God's never failed. I can look back on my life and I have failed the Lord. I have failed people, but God has never failed me. He is faithful. Now, if I could just tell you this in secret, God's never failed. His timing stinks once in a while. No, that's not true. But it sure don't line up to my timing. But he's right on time. He's just not always on your time. That's why between the promise and the fulfillment, there's living by faith, walking by faith and not by sight, by believing in the promise. And when you even have a hard time believing in the promise, then if you have a hard time with that, that's even okay if you just begin to get your eyes on the one who promised. Hebrews 10, 36 says, patient endurance is what you need now. I, I just wonder how many right here are saying, boy, that's, that's me. Patient endurance is what I need right now. Anybody got anything going on and you say, that's it. Patient endurance is what I need right now. So that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. The Bible also says in Ephesians 3.20, now all glory to God who is able. I don't know about you, I'm so glad we serve a God who is able. Through his mighty power at work within us, he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might even ask or think when we cannot even conceive it. When Abraham was old and Sarah was barren and it's in the natural impossible, we're at the end of our ability to hang on to the promise. We can still put our faith in the one who promised. Abraham trusted the one who promised. He counted God worthy and able, even though what God said, what God said went beyond his ability even to envision or conceive it. He still trusted in God. God told him that his seed, can you imagine this old man? And God said, your seed will be like the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea, too numerous to count. Abraham came to the end of his ability to believe that because he got into the flesh and tried to conceive in the flesh what was supposed to be born out of the Spirit. But the Bible said he believed, finally believed God and counted God worthy as the one who promised. If you're here and you've heard God speak something and you're thinking, oh God, how can this come to pass? If you're here right now and you're saying, God, I know you've given me a promise for my children, but they are running the opposite direction. They are crazy. You need this message because you need to get yourself back to living from a different place, from living from the inside out and begin to believe in the promise or at least the one who promised. Because when you begin to live by faith that way, Here's what's going to happen with your kids. You're going to be addressing them in a different way than if you're not living by faith. If you're hanging on to this promise, you're going to begin to, here's what's going to happen. You're going to, be to begin to see the people in your lives serving God because you're praying and God's giving you a promise. If he's given you a promise and you're hanging on to it, it'll begin, you'll begin to see them. 
through your eyes of faith and through, instead of through your eyes of flesh. It will cause something different to come out of you when you're with them. It will cause a different type of prayer, a different type of trust, a different type of hope. We need a word from the Lord. We need a word from God. The Bible says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? If he speaks it, he will bring it to pass. Boy, I tell you, I, I'm just... I'm about so excited up here. I can't hardly stand it right now. I, I sense that there are people in here that are that are going through some desperate times, and all of a sudden you're realizing, man, I've been looking at this all wrong. I, I've been dealing with this all wrong. I'm trying to deal with this in the flesh. I need to begin to deal with this in the spirit. I need to get a hold of this from the inside out. I need to begin to trust the Lord. Some some of you are here right now. Some of you are here right now, and you don't have a countenance that says, I'm a man of faith. I'm going through hell, but through is the key word. I'm, I'm going through it. I'm coming through because of the power of God. And I'm going to come through to the point that God is going to have so much victory in this, and so many lives are going to be healed and changed to where the devil is going to wish he would have never even messed with me or my family. We are coming through to greater victories than we've ever had. You love God. I'm not here to get down on you or to beat you up. I'm just here to remind you, you are a child of the Most High God. And it's time we live by faith and not by sight. It's time we live by faith and not by circumstance. It's time we live from the inside out again. It's time we trust in the one who promised. Man, I got some preaching in me today. I'm going to be having a nap this afternoon. Woo! Y'all been doing that to me lately. This second service is wild. Y'all a little wild around here. See, you're doing it. It's your fault. If you don't like this, it's your fault. You're pulling it out of me. You're, you're pulling it out of me. I remember. I remember when we first started the church, Kathy. Cliff, you remember this. We were at the Holiday Inn. We had eight weeks. That's all they could give us because of their schedule. We had eight weeks, and we didn't know where we were going after eight weeks. We didn't know where we were going to have church. And, and there were places all over the Quad Cities, and the Lord says, I want you in Moline. And I'm like, at first, I'm like, okay, but why? You know, sometimes God don't give you clear answers because he wants us to live by faith sometimes. He wants us to trust in him. Ralph, Ralph, are you here? Ralph, we looked at 60 places trying to find a place to have church on Sunday. Do you remember dragging me all over? And once in a while, you, you said a couple of times, though you never pushed me, you said, there are some other places outside of Moline. I said, Ralph, I, I believe we're supposed to be in Moline. Do you remember that? We're supposed to be in Moline. And, and you said, all right, all right. God's got, and I remember you, you even encouraging me. Ralph's a realtor, founding member of our church. And he said, Pastor, God's got a place then. I remember, I remember we've got two Sundays left. We're in the seventh Sunday. We've got one more Sunday at the Holiday Inn, and I stepped before the people. We don't have a place to go. And, I, and, and by then, I had prayed, and I had got a word in my spirit. You see, that's, that's the problem. Sometimes we don't pray. And when we don't pray, we don't get a word in our spirit. We don't receive the promise, that rhema promise. We don't, and, and then we wonder why, why we're shaking, nervous anxiety and stress and everything's coming at us well we need a word from god i don't know about you but man when, when i just shut down and go get a word from god when all the hell's breaking loose around me but i get that word from god that's all i need i get a word from god and i feel like i could tear up somebody i'm okay my daddy used to say he could you know he feel like he could walk a barbed wire fence with a bobcat under each arm if he got a word from god We're on the seventh Sunday, and I said, folks, I don't know where we're going to meet, but God has a place for us. And I begin to declare the promise. God has a place for us. 
They all clapped and cheered. We didn't know what we were going to do. I even said, if we have to bring lawn chairs and sit on my front lawn, we're going to have church. We're going to glorify God together. They all clapped and cheered again. Do you remember that at all? You do? Wow, you're pretty good for an old guy. <laughs> he remembers that. And uh, that week, Ralph, in the bottom of the ninth, isn't that the way God is sometimes? In the bottom of the ninth, Ralph called me and said, I think I got a place. The Moline Club downtown. He said, now, Pastor, they have parties and wedding receptions and all kind of wild stuff on Saturday nights. And, and sure enough, they do. And we moved in there and started having church. I told the folks the Sunday before, if we don't have a place, look at the newspaper on Saturday before the Sunday, and God's going to tell us where to go, and I'm going to put it in the newspaper, and you'll know where to come to church. And the Lord opened up a door. And, and, and boy, it was true. We're, every week, we come at 6 o'clock on Sunday morning and mop up beer, didn't we? And we clean some ugly bathrooms. I brought, I started bringing work clothes because, man, that, that work was not for my suit. Back then, I wore suits and ties. And, and uh, we'd come early, roll out carpet, set up a portable platform, portable PA, portable nursery, portable church. And we had all the stuff to set it all up. And uh, then I'd change clothes, play bass guitar for worship, and then preach. Well, I'm glad I don't have to do all that now. Wow. <laughs> but God gave us a promise. Let me give you one more word. Is, is this encouraging anybody here today? Yeah. Does anybody need this? Yeah. That when we live a life of faith, we live from a different place. We live from a different place. We live our life in faith built on promise. And I'm going to give you one more word. The life of faith causes a different priority. These are all P words. Place, promise, priority. When we live by faith, the order of things change. When we live by faith, we begin to realize God is first. See, maybe, maybe somebody here is saying, you know, I want God up there in the top five of my priority, but he may not be. First. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you the way I believe it. I believe God's first place in our life or he's no place. I believe that in every good sense of the word and right sense of the word, he is a jealous God. And he will have no other gods before him. And some of you have got things in your life that have become more first place, more God in your life than God. And people who live a life of faith get this figured out. They have a different priority system. Matthew 6, says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. King James says, First, seek ye the kingdom of God. And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Some folks wonder, why, why is all this happening to me? Well, is your priority in life the Lord? Are you living a holy and righteous life in Christ Jesus with his strength in you? Are you living just any old way you're pleased, doing anything you want, hoping the grace of God covers you, covers your mess? Or are you really seeking him with your whole heart? Do we live like we believe that scripture? Before we lived by faith, we placed our feelings and thoughts higher than the Word of God. I remember what it was to place my feelings higher than the thus saith the Lord. Whatever I felt was higher was more important than what the Word of God said. Some of you are here right now and you're fine with the Word of God unless your feelings are greater than what God's Word says. And then you tend to go with your feelings. Mm hmm Somebody told you you should not be angry Then you begin to tell them all the reasons why you feel like it's appropriate to be angry and you justify it We all justify what we do. That's how we live with ourselves But when we become a person of faith we realize that God's Word assumes priority in our lives no matter how we feel about it 
We live by faith. We realize that the Word of God is already settled. This thing is settled. God said what he meant and meant what he said, and he never had to change it because he got it right the first time. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. When we get God's word in a place of priority in our lives, we'll find out that when we walk through wilderness experiences and the enemy is tempting us, we can say like Jesus said to the devil in the desert in Matthew 4, 4, he said to Satan, it is written. God's word was priority in the Lord's life. The will of the Father was a priority to Jesus. And because it was, he could look at the devil and say, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's by faith we start prioritizing the word of God in our lives. That means we stay away from things that robs our priorities. We stay away from things that rob us of our priorities. I see somebody taking notes. We stay away from things that rob us of our priorities. I see somebody that should be taking notes. We stay away from things that rob us of our priorities. There are folks, can we just talk? Can we just talk here for a moment? There are folks who are experts at robbing you of your, and causing doubt and unbelief and negativity in your spirit. Yes. They love to throw sand in your spirit. They come up to you and talk to you, and, and when they walk away, you know what I'm talking about. You feel all ugly inside when they just talk to you. Yes. All of a sudden, you're thinking, where did my faith go? I was believing God until they showed up. The big faith buster showed up and robbed me. In living by faith, we must not allow them to have influence in our lives. Listen to this. I'm going to say this. We can be nice and sweet to everybody, but we don't have to let people mess us up. We don't even have to listen to everybody. I found out that just because somebody's heart is beaten and their brain is firing does not mean we have to entertain their thoughts. Do you understand? Some of you could understand. If I, do you understand that if I listened to everybody, I most assuredly would not be standing up here today preaching the Word of God. I would most assuredly not be in my right mind. I would be cuckoo. I would be out of order. I'd be sign on my head out of order (laughs) you can't listen to everybody if you listen to everybody you won't be able to hear God every question that is asked not does not have to be answered Some of you get into trouble on your job because you think that since you got saved, you're now the Bible encyclopedia for everybody's religious questions. Some people come up with questions that have a spirit of strife attached to them. They're not just asking you a question because they're wanting to iron sharpen iron. They're wanting to love their brother. They're wanting to really understand the Word of God. No, they're asking you a question with strife attached to it. Titus 3 and verse 9 says, don't get involved in arguing over unanswerable questions and controversial theological ideas. That means sometimes those questions are not asked for information's sake. It was a question asked to stir up a mess and you fell in the trap. Come on, somebody. More than one time in my life, I've had people ask me questions And I've had to realize, this is more than a question. I told somebody once, I told somebody once, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this, but I'm going to, I told somebody once, hey, when you get the discord off of that question and you get the strife out of it, we'll talk. Until then, God bless you.
When we're functioning in faith, we begin to learn how to stay clear of stuff that needs to be avoided until God assigns us to it. Now, let me give you the other part of that, the other side of that equation. Every fool cannot be avoided. Every fool cannot be avoided. Somebody ought to tweet that. That's tweetable. Every fool cannot be avoided. Be nice when you do it now. Be nice. Build yourself up in faith because every fool cannot be avoided. We, got, we need some lean muscle, spiritual muscle on the inside to get rid of those fat cells that drag us down. There are some folks that can be avoided and need to be avoided. And I don't mean treated poorly. I mean just stay out of their path. I'm talking about people who are causing you strife and fighting you against your faith. Some people make a game out of it by which they leverage emotional and psychological energy by saying to you that they're never going to be saved, and so your mission in life becomes, I'm going to get them saved. You, you forgot, you can't save anybody. Sometimes the best thing you can do with people like that is just say this to them, I'm not worrying about you being saved, and when you get tired of heading yourself to hell, come and we'll talk. Because most of those folks love attention, and they like the emotional and conversational stimulation of arguing and bickering. They like fussing at you. They like watching you squirm. They like making, they're miserable, so they like making you miserable. Hurting people hurt people. There are some people that you got to tell, I thank God for you. I love you, but we're not going to a place of strife today. And we're not arguing about this no more, honey. God bless you. We're not arguing no more. We, we have to say, we have to say to some people, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. I've given you my testimony, dear sweetheart. I've laid my hands on you. I've continued, and I will continue to pray for you. I've pled the blood of Jesus over you, and I've released angels on you. God bless you. Bye-bye. I hope that doesn't sound mean. Whenever you get ready to be saved, let me know because I'll be happy to minister you. But until then, you, you've got to be on your way. Some of you may not like what I'm saying right now because this is hard for some of you because you love these folks so much and you want so much, but the problem is you want it more for them than they want it for themselves. Some of you may not like what I'm saying, but can I just tell you, I'm right. I'm right about this. I realize some fools cannot be avoided. You have to work with some of them. Pastor Rod laughed. That made me nervous. I felt that one over here. Some of them live pretty close to home. Somebody's got one that lives in the house. <laughs> they get ready to go to the family reunions and they've been preparing for three weeks on how to mess up all the Christians in their family. They thought of every Bible question they can think of about how to mess you up and every reason for there not to be a God. You're just going there to love on your family. Have a great time. You're so excited, but they've been, they, they're looking for you. They've been preparing. They've been studying every shortcoming you have in great detail. These kinds of people cannot be avoided all the time, but we got to get to where we can shut some of this down and still be nice. We can learn how to deal with unsavory people and not allow the things going on around us to mess up what God's doing on the inside of us. Why? Because the life of faith is lived 
from the inside out. And everything is going to be all right. Our priority is God's plan and his word to us. We can sing, begin to sing choruses on the inside. And we can begin to pray in the spirit again on the inside. Some of you used to know how to pray in the spirit. You stopped. You're going to pick that up again this week. You're going to begin to hum again. Some of you quit your humming. You got to go back to humming the praises of our God in your spirit. You, you got to begin to feed your inner man again with the word and the praises of our God. And when you do, when you begin to praise the Lord, praise means raise. When you praise the Lord, he begins to raise you up. When you begin to bless his name, he becomes magnified. That means he becomes bigger than anything going on in your life. Some of you, the devils, you've allowed the enemy to take away your praise, to take away your hum, to take away your prayers, to take away that, that inner being of, of just being in the presence at all times in the Lord. You got to get back there. That's called living by faith. Some of you, if I can just be honest, you're probably not speaking words of faith. You're not speaking words of victory. You're speaking words of death. You're speaking words of negativity. You're, you're speaking down instead of speaking up. You're, you're not speaking life. See, I love you. You're good folks. You're good people. You love God. You just slipped a gear. Come on, you need a tune-up. You, you need an oil change. Come on, let's get back to living by faith. Believing in the promises of God are true and amen. God's people, this world out here needs a people that know how to live by faith. Quit being moved by everything going on that's crazy. The world's crazy. And it's on your street and it's next door to you and it's, it's across the way. This world needs some people that when they see us, they don't see us. They see some victory. They see Jesus. They, they see some confidence that we're there. When they know you, they, they know you have problems like, I, how, how did they handle this so well? They got joy on them. When I know there's tough times happening. Why? Because the faith on the inside is louder and bigger than anything on the outside. If you notice, I'm not telling you that faith causes all your problems to go away and now we just, we just swing low, sweet chariot until Jesus comes and everything's lovey-dovey. Woohoo! I'm saved and everything's perfect. No, I'm not telling you that. Do not go out of here and say I said that. We, we like that song, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Oh, we're, we're saved now. We're just going to go over all the problems. No, that, that song's not technically right. If anything, he, he's a bridge through troubled water. He brings us through. And Romans 8 tells me that, that when we get this, when God brings us through this junk that the enemy sometimes throws at us and life throws at us, it will come to a point where when we come through with a victory, we're going to learn things through it. We're, we're going to be more empowered, more strengthened by the, we're going to have more trust in the Lord until the devil's going to wish he never even messed with you because everything he did now, God's turning it for so much good that the devil's like, man, I wish I hadn't even messed with that. That's, right. That's, right. That's what's going to happen. I'm not done, but I think I'm done. The, 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 I really feel like the Lord just said, that's it. And I'm trying to learn how to listen to that because every time I try to finish my notes when the Lord says I'm done, it usually messes up. I want you to walk out of here today with a little more click in your heels than some of you came in here with. Get them shoulders back. Get that smile on your kisser. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through, Pastor. 
and you don't know what I'm going through. But greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. I want to pray with you. I want to seal this in prayer before we walk out of here. And before I do that, I just have felt in my heart that today is a day that I need to say, who is here this morning? Or we're afternoon now. Who is here right now? And you've not had an opportunity to confess in public that Jesus is your Savior, that Jesus is your Lord. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But it means you haven't had an opportunity to public, publicly confess. You see, I believe our relationship with the Lord is personal, but it's not private. We are to publicly confess that Jesus is Savior and Lord. That's what the Bible says. Confess with your mouth that he is Savior and Lord. And I just wonder here this morning, before we close in prayer, I wonder who is here across this building that says, I love the Lord, Pastor. And maybe you're here and say, the Lord's stirring in me. Maybe you couldn't put it in words what God's doing in your life, but you know God's got a hold of you. There's some whole new thing going on inside of you. And, and you just want to recognize before your family here today. This is your family, your spiritual family. God's working in me. God's at work in my life. God's doing something. He's shaping me. I'm not everywhere I need to be, but I, I do believe I'm on a journey with the Lord. Pray for me, Pastor, that God will in strength, strengthen me to live for him like never before. I just wonder who needs to come up here and take my hand and say, that's me. I want to confess that Jesus has got me today. I want to pray and believe God. Who's going to break the ice? Who, who needs to come down here and take me by the hand? Is there anybody here? All right, right here. Right here. Is there anybody else? Ben's going to help me. Thank you, Ben. All right. You. Bless you guys. God bless you, honey. Love you. In the Lord. Amen. Who else? Come on. All right. You had no idea you were going to do this today, did you? But the Lord knew. This is your day. This is your spiritual birthday in the Lord. God bless you, honey. God bless you. Hey. Proud of you. you guys could have stayed in your seat, but you didn't. You said, you know what? I need to confess before my family. I belong to Jesus. I am his and he is mine. I'm going to ask one more time. I'm not begging anybody. This, if I have to beg, you, you don't need to come. But, but if you're here and you say, you know, see, there's something humbling about standing up and coming down here in there. It, 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 there's something humbling. And the Lord loves humility. We, we recognize we are nothing. He's everything. And he raises us up. We humble ourselves, and he lifts us up. I'm going to ask one more time. Does anybody else need to be up here with these folks? Is this your day? Is this your moment? And you don't need to be missing it? All right. I'm going to believe God that everybody here is saved. That doesn't mean you are, but I want to believe that you are right let's pray Lord I thank you for each one here today I thank you for the Spirit of Christ that's working in these ladies lives Lord all right man God bless you praise God amen you're right on time dude. you're right on time This is tough on us guys. God's got you, don't he, man? Yeah, he's been calling you. He's been calling you. And now you're answering. Four times. Amen. Four times. Okay. Praise God. Give the Lord praise. Isn't God good? Thank you, Lord. I thank you for your sweet presence, Lord. I thank you that these people up here today are going to live a life of faith and trust in you. Whatever they're going through in their lives, Lord, we're all going through stuff. 
that you are the lover of our souls, that you raise us up. And with a relationship with you, Lord, you'll get bigger in our lives and everything else will have to take its place. So I speak blessing. I want, I want to lead you in a prayer, and I want you to speak this prayer out loud, all of you that are up here. I want you to say it out loud. Repeat after me if you believe it. And we're going to declare and we're going to repent Ask the Lord to do his great work in our lives. I can't save you. You can't save yourself. It's a gift from God. And um, I want you to pray these. I want you to pray it out loud because you need, your help. you need to hear yourself speak these words of life. God loves to hear it because Jesus, his son, died for you. And I believe the devil needs to hear it. The devil needs to hear from your mouth, I belong to Jesus. Amen. Now, I want everybody else out here in the audience to pray with these. I'm, let's all repeat this prayer out loud together for strength for these that are up here. Come on, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins that I failed you, Lord. And I caused you to have to die on the cross for my sins. You died for me so that I could have new life. I'm sorry, Lord. I receive your forgiveness. Though in myself I'm not worthy, you made me worthy to receive your love and your goodness. So by faith, I receive this gift. I say yes to God. And no to the devil. I belong to Jesus. I'm a child of God. And I'm going to march forward with your help and live a life of faith. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness in me. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now look. I want, I want you all to stay here for just a moment. I've got a, a little book I want to give you if you don't have it. And if you've never filled out a little card, I want you to fill it out and give it to me with your address because I want to write a letter of encouragement to you this week that I hope will minister to you. If you don't have a Bible, a starter Bible, we've got a good one we want to give you. We just want to bless on you. We want to help you in your journey. Some of you around here, I see you here. This has become home to you. Some of you, maybe you don't know about Calvary that much. If you need a church home and you could put up with me, we want you here. We want you to be a part of our family. And we're going to grow up together in the Lord. And God's going to do good stuff in our lives. And when we hit bumps along the way, we're going to come through with faith and trust in the Lord. Amen. And so we love you. Stay here for a moment. I'm going to dismiss everybody. And then we're going to give you these gifts and let you go. Come on, everybody. Stand up. Father, I thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for the house of the Lord. I pray everybody leaves here today. Those that need to be a part of the membership class Saturday, they'll get signed up right away. Lord, ask somebody in the foyer how to do that today, even before they leave or on their computer, on their phone to register and come have breakfast with Kathy and me. And, and let's go forward together as the body of Christ, Lord. And uh, learn about membership, Lord. Learn about being a part of the body. I pray that th those who need to be there will do that. Lord, this Wednesday night as we have prayer and praise here in the house at 630, this will be a special time. I thank you for what you're doing in our church. And, and then the next Wednesday of baptism and being outside and having fun with the family. Thank you for all the good things, Lord, in our church today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed.